uh, eight or nine years ago, uh, before I had ever spoken at Esalen, uh, or anywhere for that matter, Kat uh, described me once as somebody who wants to rule the world without leaving their own living room. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so what? <laughs> I mean, we live in a culture where people regularly jump out of airplanes for recreational pleasure. That's the kind of culture we live in. And yet DMT has not made its way very deeply into that culture. I mean, if, if what people want is thrills, my God, are there, are there thrills still untapped? However, I, I've noticed this, the surrender issue works here. I've talked to people who sailed solo around the world, climbed the north face of Everest, shot the rapids on the Mekong, and so forth. And so say, oh, well, you're a real hairy-chested guy. Uh, would you like to smoke some DMT? And, you know, absolutely ashen. No, absolutely not. Are you crazy? That stuff's dangerous. <laughs> Said, well, what about the time you parachuted into Kilimanjaro at the 22,000 foot level? Uh, said, well, I knew what I was doing. It was, uh, I, I was in, so, uh, I, I don't know, different, different thrills for, for different folks. Uh. I'm a little off balance because I held a weekend at Esalen two weeks ago and you know they allow the people who participate in the workshops to evaluate people and I got dinged and somebody wrote an evaluation and said uh, Terence McKenna is the William Buckley of the psychedelic left and he needs to learn to listen. So um, <clears throat> you'll see me doing or trying to do a lot of listening uh, this, this weekend. Whoever went in to the ashram with their knees knocking with terror over what the next yoga session would bring? I mean, give me a break. The new age is, is uh, well, new anything means you should put one hand over your wallet. Uh, and the other hand over your asshole. But, and, and so the, the, think about it. <laughs> I, well, I have been vegetarian for long periods in my life. Uh, now I, I sort of follow the hippie philosophy that your body knows what it wants, even if it's a snicker. Uh, <laughs> the deeper wisdom of the body. Uh, the tykes want to initiate you. They have a message. And the message is, you can do what we are doing. And what they're doing is using their voices to make physical objects condense out of the air. And they're saying, you can do this. Do it. Do it. Do it! That's it. By the water of Babylon. <laughs> Babylon. Will you still love me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? <laughs> So then you turn this over to a straight therapist or something, and they, and they say, you know, this is clearly an antediluvian projection from the collective. Well, I don't know. Uh, Silence. Stoicism. The ability to sit on a point while other guys go behind the animals and drive them toward you. 
quiet over long periods of time, this sort of thing. In other words, it's not an environment that would induce you to great feats of oral poetry. I mean, you started that, I think everybody was like, shh, cool it, you know. But I got on to the source, and you know, you, on the source you can word search the membership for interest. So I typed out drugs, <laughs> and it came back and said there were 850 people on the network who had written that drugs were an interest of theirs. So then I started checking, I said, okay, drugs without sex and rock and roll came back four people. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it didn't solve all my, uh, my uh, affinity group problems. You can interrupt at any time with a question, and I, I'm not entirely clear on who I'm talking to, whether I'm talking to hallucinogen enthusiasts, anthropologists, epidemiologists, psychologists, the police. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> There is another factor enhancing the reproductive strategy, which is more instances and more vigorous instances of enthusiastic copulation. Hello? <laughs> so I, I'm not into the white guy at the front of the room with all the answers trip. It's just unfortunate that I have the body I do. I'm actually a lesbian trapped in a man's body, but I've done the very best with that that I could, which hasn't been bad, let me tell you. Yesterday on the shuttle bringing me from the airport, we delivered an elderly lady to Kensington, and when she found out that she would be delivered to, directly to her door, she said, that's right on, far out. <laughs>
that that's what it says. It says, I require the nervous system of a mammal. Do you have one handy? <laughs> a person can be, can consider themselves new age, I suppose, if they just practice affirmations and try to keep their cholesterol low. Well, that's a far cry from uh, signing up at the solar temple and uh, giving all your money away and beginning to uh, use Moldavite suppositories. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that, so that when you draw, obviously, we all are at different places in our time wave. Otherwise, when I'm happy, you'd be happy. And when I lose money, you'd lose money. And it doesn't work that way. I mean, some people are miserable in the presence of other people's joy, uh, often causally related. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, these people are at different places uh, in, in the cycle. All these other methods somehow uh, establish an automatic elitism. You know, that those who advance must necessarily be somehow better. And in the psychedelic world, we know those who advance are not better, they're braver. <laughs> the revolution that wanted to give everybody LSD also wanted to uh, have sex in the streets. This was a banner. I've shouted it myself through the streets. But hey... Uh, is that going to do a lot for relationships to have an orgy at the corner of Bancroft and Telegraph? Will, will this make us all better able to relate to our significant other? Uh, I'm not sure. What would it be like, or, or what lessons could we draw if we were to get all hyped up, create a green world, save the rainforest, and on December 22nd, the sun explodes. <laughs> you know, this would be a rather wry comment on, on the nature of the political and consciousness-raising enterprise. Our subconscious awareness of these systems of temporal resonance operating around us. So, you know, as I look out at a crowd like this, if I let myself go, you know, I notice that Kant is sleeping in the corner and that Madame Lafarge seems to have just come in from the baths and taken her seat and uh, Cleopatra is uh, headed for the john and so forth and so on. How real is this? Mm -hmm. Who knows? We were laughing the other night, some friends of mine and I, over the revelation on the internet uh, on the part of a certain sect which guards its uh, privacy very highly. It was revealed against their wishes that the central teaching of this sect was that God is a clam on another planet. <laughs> and we were just puzzling over, you know, um, just how such a teaching and how its impact could be correctly managed. Uh, we have the most powerful ally which the traditional shamans had, and that is the plants. The plants teach. Fundamentally, shamanism is a one-to-one -one relationship between a person and a plant. And if you know what I mean, you know what I mean. If you don't, it just sounds like somebody's advocating that you talk to lettuces. Catholicism is just such a strange thing. There's an amazing scene in, in the, bed, the philosophers of the boudoir where this woman is assaulting her nephew while having homosexual sex with her sister-in-law while hanging a goat while doing something else and in the center of this incredible scene of multiple perversity she looks up from her work and points out to the abbey with the whip raised above her she says and I am being a bad example <laughs> which is just the, 
you know, the <laughs> icing on the cake. If you are not a bad example, what's the point, you know? <laughs> and as you can tell, there are an infinite number of ways of slicing the perceptual pie when you're contemplating any phenomena, and consequently, the potential for understanding in any given situation is infinite. And it was as though this was being realized in me. And I would go out and I would like pick up a leaf. And it seemed to me that by looking at this leaf, you know, the sum total of the science of botany was somehow pouring into my cognition. And um, why am I talking about this? I'm not talking about this. Um, rescue me somebody. I'm happy to be back here. I always like staying in this house because it's haunted. It is haunted. I, have other people said this? It, the haunting takes the form of people walking around in the middle of the night uh, after 3 a.m. just padding around. You know, here's one way to dissolve the ego. You blow it apart. And like mercury, or that's another good metaphor, like smashing a flask of mercury on the floor in front of you, the stuff of the <clears throat> psyche, the fluid metal of the self, sends back then a thousand reflections. And they all are distorted reflections, as they would be, and they all are peculiarly familiar, hauntingly familiar, because guess who it is? It's your good old self. But in some, put through some filter, some distorting lens of transformation that uh, gives you the impression that, you know, a swarm, you're now encountering a swarm of alien, uh, insectoid, machine, elf, toy, cyborg, viruses, or something like that. What could have been the question? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, got it, got it. <laughs> you, but it, but it's, it's yeah, well, you have to hang. You don't talk to the Pope. You hang the Pope. <laughs> then you talk to the Dalai Lama after he watches the Pope hang. <laughs> a, syncre a new syncretic religion? Yes. Well, you could just say, Fat man, give me that guitar. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll do the plucking from here on. <laughs> no, I, I... Well... Uh, <laughs> Killed by cow farts. <laughs> well, nobody said life wasn't fraught with peril, right? <laughs> or humor. Or humor, yes. <laughs> I really believe, I mean, I'm a strange sort of a paradox because people who know me know that I'm a very unpleasant, cynical, caustic person. You know, if, if you want to know something unpleasant about somebody, as Dorothy Parker used to say, sit by me. <laughs> it talks to you. It actually sits down with you and says, you know, did you know, I'll bet you didn't know, that everyone's little finger just fits their nostril, or whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever it is that it wishes to convey. Your mind takes this incoming acoustical pattern and searches a dictionary for a matching pattern. Now, if you have a matching pattern, you have, you get the feeling of understanding. If you have no matching pattern, you say, what, what do you say, what? <laughs> but the most uncool thing that can happen in an environment where people are trying to communicate is for one person to say to another, uh, excuse me, would you tell me what it was that I just said? <laughs> Immediately it comes to a screeching halt. 
because in fact most communication is going on in the dimension of uh huh yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, 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 no real communication at all. The house knocks the witch down, and she's in Munchkin land, and the head of the Munchkins comes with a scroll, and they all have very squeaky voices, and they sing a little song about, <laughs> You are absolutely and completely dead! <laughs> and they're marching around her. <laughs> so the Munchkins come, these hyperdimensional machine elf entities, and they bathe you in love. The manure deposit is a vector for insect protein in this environment and having a limited amount of energy they look for food in the place where it's likely to be. However, by a marvelous coincidence or superb planning on the part of the extraterrestrials who rule the galaxy, you can sort of <laughs> choose your poison. Ah, the, the lunatic fringe is not unrepresented. Good, good. Of which I m number myself uh, among them. Uh, there are some wild thinkers out there, far wilder than me. Uh, you know, if you want to read a wild book, read uh, um, Hans Moravec's book, Mind Children, The Future of Human and Artificial Intelligence. And there's a book. Uh, and uh, I'm having a memory lapse here. Help Tipler. me out. Tipler. I said, help me out with a memory lapse. You don't have to read my mind, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Creon. <laughs> T Tipler's uh, book is a... Uh, uh, the end of all speculation where artificial intelligence uh, is concerned. And it's this weird political correctness where people do not say what you just said is preposterous. It makes no sense whatsoever. This is just thought so ungenerous of spirit to point out that someone makes no sense at all. It, it's that their feelings, I think, have become preeminent in the value system. It's more important not to hurt someone's feelings than to let them walk around with a head full of crap. So uh, having identified this as a problem and having never been terribly sensitive to other people's feelings <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was a good person <laughs> to uh, send to the ramp. Uh, how many of you were at the Whole Life Expo yesterday? How many of you bought a quartz crystal there? This <laughs> 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 needed to hold the line on the One each. One, one person, one crystal. A reasonable way to handle the destruction of the tropical rainforest that is going on to allow the airlifting of crystalline uh, silicon to Malibu. So <laughs> be aware that the trees die so that these uh, objects can find their way into our hands. When you hear somebody lead with credentials, ex NASA scientist, I used feel like I should reach for my revolver. How many ex-NASA scientists are there around with crack-brained ideas? And is this why they're ex-NASA scientists? Because they had to be let go because their belief in 13th planets, uh, higher dimensional gods on the face of Mars and so forth and so on uh, interfered with them doing their job. Uh, I mean, how many, how many philandering zennies have to parade before us? How many kagyupts with a Budweiser welded to their good right hand do we have to encounter uh, before you get the message? Uh, you know, these guys are just slime balls at worst and lost souls at best, and you're smarter than they are by an order of magnitude anyway, so why waste your time? Now, if you want to follow, if you just can't tear yourself away from the concept of following, then, you know, how about Plato, Heraclitus, 
Parmenides, Plotinus, Proclus, you know, dead guys, they're much safer, <laughs> you know. They're not going to try and climb into your wallet or uh, some delicate portion of your anatomy. Plus, uh, they've been use-tested uh, in the historical arena. Uh, and uh, have been found to be generally at, at least harmless at worst, and in some cases actually to be recommended. Uh, don't follow. Following is a, is a tasteless position to find yourself in. Pets follow, vice presidents follow, and bad acts follow. So, you know, why follow? All of, all of these uh, gurus, geishas, roshis, and rishis are simply flim-flam artists. They've had thousands of years to get these cons together and run them on you. Believe me, I know, I'm a recovering Catholic. You have to fight your way free of belief and then do not follow. Just to show I'm really one of the gang. I mean, I've, how, I, here I am, there are 200 people here, whatever, and I do this all the time. And I have not, so far as I can tell, been able to launch an avalanche of DMT. I'm trying. Do I have to put it any more plainly? Is there a chemist in the house who will go home and make this stuff so that we can find our way there? Or grow the plants? Or go to South America? or get with lucid dreaming and behavioral modification, or explore the outer edges of orgasm, which I think has something to do with DMT and probably runs on it. Somehow, we need to beach this whale. So I got it out to roll the evening's joint, and, uh, and I was fumbling with it, and I got this thing lit, and this little, this little crumb, this little burning thing fell on the floor. And I uh, lifted it up and uh, smelled it. And uh, <laughs> you know, the transubstantiation had occurred. It was, you know, like Mazari Sharif, triple A, red lion, hashish of some sort. And I know hashish. I, and here we were in the center of the Amazon, uh, in this hut, in this pouring rain, and I could tell that it was the good, it was the good shit, it, it had actually manifest. So some people can't tell whether I'm a, a half shaman, half scientist. I think probably the answer is simply half-baked. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that a human being can feel 50 micrograms of a compound is like a miracle. I mean, to give you an analogy so you can understand that, that's like having one red ant tear down the Empire State Building in 30 minutes. I mean, that, that's what it looks like when 50 gamma of LSD enter your body. Because there's something about the anal retentive primate mind that we want to button it down, you know, and say, well, it's this or it's that, with no sense of irony, no sense of scale, no tongue-in-cheek approach at all. I mean, if you met a termite who aspired to understand the cosmic workings of the universe, you would just roll your eyes at such a naive... Uh, misunderstanding of one's own position in the cosmos. Well, do you think we stand so far from where the termite stands that our musings about how the cosmos works are carrying much force? I don't, I don't think so. I don't know what the number is. They keep pushing it up. But they say 35% uh, uh, of the American public believe flying saucers are real. Well, now, first of all, are we being asked to believe that 35% of the American public can carry on a coherent discussion of the concept real? <laughs> you know? As real as what? As real as Madonna's talents? 
as real as Clinton's integrity? How real are the UFOs? Culture is a con game designed to bewilder you for 35 to 40 years. And then if by some miracle you can outlive that span of time, a strange realization will begin to dawn as you sit at the poker table. You'll realize, this is a, this is a bunch of crap. <laughs> no, I've been had. Well, up until very recently, o only a very few people in any society lived into those ages, and then that was called wisdom. Uh, he said, you know, he just sits on his porch and rocks and occasionally chuckles. Uh, I was in a restaurant in Malibu uh, with Bob Chartoff and Lou Carlino, who some of you know, a bunch of fancy Hollywood-type people. And there was this French uh, producer there, this woman, and she and I had been seated together at dinner, and she said, you see that the mushroom speaks to you, but I don't understand how this can be. What do you mean it speaks to you? And, I, in, and Ralph Abraham was there too, and I, in my sincere way, said, well, it's like the part Steiger played in The Pawnbroker. It just... And at that moment, Steiger stops by the table to shake hands with everybody there. And I'm like, <laughs> and <clears throat> true story, true story. And Ralph, who's watched this whole thing go down, leans across the table to me and says, what this proves is the mushroom can reach into our world no matter where we are and shake the bars. <laughs>So some people can't tell whether I'm a, a half shaman, half scientist. I think probably the answer is simply half bait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is the sound comfortable for everyone? Is the light comfortable for everyone? And are you comfortable? Well, you shouldn't be. The planet's going to shit in a handbag. <clears throat> no, I'm... I'm that's just my John Lilly imitation. It's not me at all. A few years ago, we bought uh, 10 acres in Hawaii and moved as many of these Peruvian drug plants as we could get uh, in there. So that was four or five years ago. Now those plants are grown, and hopefully the next time we go back to Hawaii, we'll be able to produce ayahuasca. We're calling it Hawaiiwaska. <laughs> part of my audience is part of the problem. And it's a really weird experience to have someone come up to you after a talk and say, you know, I love your stuff. I, I, there aren't very many people I respect, and I love your stuff, and I also love... And then they name two indictable morons from the land of woo-woo and you think oh my god you know this person has no power of discrimination whatsoever i am a pearl placed among swine either <laughs> they're wrong or i'm wrong in any case there's enough wrong around to be disturbing uh because what you want to do it, it is be understood the Eleusinian mysteries, the mysteries which were practiced on the plain outside of Athens every year for over 2,000 years. And everybody who was anybody in the ancient world made the journey to Eleusis to celebrate the greater mysteries. It was extraordinarily powerful for the ancient world. Eventually it was destroyed. Alaric the Visigoth who was a barbarian, but that didn't stop him from being a convert to Christianity. Uh, <laughs> Alaric the Visigoth burned Eleusis uh, on his way to North Africa to burn other things. <laughs> but when I listen to recordings of this glossolalia uh, down, 
I, it makes me very uncomfortable, and I wonder what could possibly be the matter with me that I've placed so much emphasis on this. And I've noticed, uh, you know, it'll clear most rooms in a hurry. I mean, I mean, it's it's all people are with it, you know, and they say, oh, it's far out, and all this stuff, and then you play it, and they say, well, you know. I've got to go do something. <laughs> I mean, they draw back. It so seems too, too quirky. Too quirky. Chikwai ko haka vuhungulut e vundu buhupiti ichut u kwaksa fabavangulutech mihuni goto deva hoichpulut. So it's a tremendous empowerment for eccentricity. And basically, my whole career is based on eccentricity. One of the most fearful questions to come my way is when I'm riding on airplanes to some situation like this, and someone sits down beside me and says, so what do you do? <laughs> and I usually, I, tr I try to escape. I say, and this is always a horribly weak thing, I say, oh, I write books. And then they say, oh, well, what do you write books about? And then we move into the realm of pure lie. I usually say, travel. <laughs> and we know from laboratory experiments that if you set uh, monkeys in a situation where they can uh, smoke DMT by just walking up to a uh, pipette and taking a hit, that... 20% of the monkeys will refuse food and water in preference to that. Well, now... So, so yes, that's us. We'd rather be stoned. And then culture seems to step in to put the nails in the coffin to completely neotenize you. And so we have... Uh, you know, 65-year-old uh, men running around in sweatpants and Nike running shoes and everybody having their butt tucked and their tits pumped and all of this. Well, what is this? This is a culture of youth, uh, youth values. Only the youthful body, only the youthful vigor is, uh, is worth talking about. And uh, it sells. You know, if you can get people really neurotically twisted around this idea, then instead of life being an unfoldment into wisdom, it's an anxiety-producing fall away from a perfect state of youth, which can only then be approached through dyeing your hair, wearing certain colognes, certain brands of clothes, psychotherapy, yada, yada, yada. Yes, I'll repeat this. Um, and strengthen once again my case to the guy who owns the company that he should pay me, for God's sake. Um, if you want a catalog of extremely rare and useful psychoactive and magical plants, probably the most complete in the world, the company is called Of the Jungle, P.O. Box 1801, Sebastopol. S-E-B-A-S-T-O-P-O-L, California, 95472. Write and ask for a catalog and tell them George Bush sent you. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Don't tell them that. They won't send you the catalog. <laughs> in in Colombia, once, I saw a graffiti, and it, on my Spanish, I can't get it right, but what it was... There was a picture of a mushroom, and it said, Without this, you are not yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but Shavroshkin and his people are now talking about a language called Old World. And Old World is the first language ever spoken on this planet by higher primates. Beyond Old World, there is inarticulate silence. And Old World is a 35,000-year-old language. Uh, how can we know such things? You have to push into the linguistic literature, and you're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. But there are websites you can go to where people speak in Old World, and you can hear what it sounded like. And um, 
Sounds like a bunch of really primitive people. <laughs> well, but as I lay in the tubs at Esalen, a vast vocabulary of subtle gradients of interpersonal states of angst, longing, need, rejection, triumph, and defeat are passed in front of me. And frankly, I rather read my manual on my hard disk sometimes. <laughs> but I'm a tough nut to, to crack. Um, I'm not proud of the fact that the highest I can get is to teach at Esalen. I'm not at all proud of the fact that that seems to be where I top out. Had I greater courage, I would go further. But I don't. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you people, my graduate students, as it were, will sacrifice yourselves on the pyre of going further and, uh, and, and report back. The situation I described with these octopi was uh, coastal, shallow water octopi so-called circulitoral octopi, but they have also evolved into the depths, the so-called abyssal octopi that exist below 1,500 meters in the sea where there is absolute darkness. And to carry their intention to communicate into that darkness over the past 700 million years, they have evolved phosphorescent organs and have covered themselves with lights with eyelid-like membranes that can be rapidly blinked and flickered so that when you descend into the abyss, you then see pure linguistic intentionality among the cephalopoidea because they have become what we aim to become under the wise leadership and stewardship of George Bush, namely, a thousand points of light. <laughs> <laughs> Is this guy for real? <laughs> if I had eight hands, I could really get gestural. I, I, a funny experience involving octopi. I know a woman. I'm sure she would not begrudge me this description of her. She is a, a very frank exhibitionist. I mean, this is the woman who at every party takes her clothes off and dances on the tabletops and so forth. She is an inveterate exhibitionist. She's totally frank about it. And um, I, I uh, had been to the Monterey Aquarium and seen the octopus there. They have a giant octopus. Well, most of the time this guy just hunkers low and he's sort of off in a corner, one beady eye, checking you out. But, of course, because octopi have this mode of communication, uh, uh, they're very set up to respond to visual display. So this woman walked past this tank, and this octopus practically leaped into the air. It came down out of the tunnel. It was pressing against the glass. It was beating against the glass. And what it was, was one exhibitionist recognizing another. I mean, it was just clear across the species lines. Uh, the power of neurosis knows no barrier. <laughs> Perhaps, as someone said, it sounds like megalomania to me, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as bandwidth expands, the web is going to become much more of an interactive and, as you say, virtual environment. And uh, I'm, I'm learning all this stuff. This is where my heart is these days. I don't want to have to depend on other people to implement things for me. And I've discovered learning this software is like mental calisthenics. I mean, you really do get buffed up intellectually <laughs> if you can run Ray Dream Designer and render 3D objects and embed them in VRML. It's, it's, and it's a great way to relate to your children. Oh, wow, yeah, because they're using three steps ahead. <laughs> <laughs> right.
One of the uses suggested for nanotechnology somewhat facetiously was that you could have these little electronic mites that you combed into your hair and every day they would creep out to the end of each hair, measure its length and cut it off. So you'd have a permanent haircut maintained by nanomites from Clairol. <laughs> Now, I've been accused of uh, mysticism. <coughs> and worse. <laughs> As to your question about what would I be doing if I hadn't taken psychedelics, well, I don't know. What I was doing, what I assumed I would end up doing before I took psychedelics was hopefully end up teaching art history in a very exclusive Eastern girls school somewhere uh, for a long, long time. It was a kind of Nabokovian lecture was uh, my life's plan. It's like realizing and embracing the fact that you're an actor. Right. I grapple with this all the time because uh, when I'm brushing my teeth, I find myself humming, there's no business like show business. There's no people like show people. And what you do is you sing. That's what the shamans do. You sing. It doesn't matter what you sing. The idea is sit up, open your mouth, and sing. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Sing, and then it will move. It will move on you. But if you clench, then it just is hell. They understand that psychedelics are a blowtorch to their ice cube. They don't want to get near it. You know, they used to have the excuse that they, even though they were going to spend a lifetime criticizing psychedelics, they couldn't invest t six hours to find out what it was about. Well, so then we brought them DMT, which lasts five minutes. So now the new excuse is, well, as a professional person, I don't choose to break the law. Fine, here's some alpha salvinorine. It's unscheduled, it lasts five minutes, it'll cut your head off. Uh, will you do it? And they say, well, uh, no, I have a heart murmur or I have an appointment in 20 minutes or something. There is absolute terror to confront the reality of what this represents. My idea of how to do the guide is, okay, I'm going to take six grams of mushrooms. I will be in this room. Uh, here is a closed door. You be on the other side of this closed door. And if I ring this bell three times, you may open the door a crack and say, what? That's the guide. The idea, I mean, I've heard people say, you know, I, I, I took mushrooms and I was just beginning to work it out. And then the guide said, well, now, remember, you wanted to work on some issues uh, while you were loaded. Now, uh, what about your impending gum surgery, divorce, bankruptcy? And, and you're just saying, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was touching God. Do you mind? <laughs> so... <clears throat> And how I got into this, like the gentleman who asked the question, is by being in the Amazon, by having searched India to see, say, you know, what can you show me? And they couldn't show me anything. They wanted me to sweep the ashram for 12 years and then something wonderful was going to happen. And I, and, but then when I got to South America, I said, what can you show me? And this guy said, let's sharpen our machetes. We'll go out here and get some of this snake vine and come back and I'll show you. And by 10 o'clock that night, you know, I was sobbing in the guy's arms. He'd shown me. I was a convert. I'd sweep his courtyard for 12 years without asking. Yeah. <laughs>
to put the greatness of writers in perspective, uh, I'll tell you a story about the last time I dealt with my publisher at Bantam in New York, uh, sitting across from those people uh, above the 50th floor. How I come off to them is, well, now let's see, Mr. McKenna, we have current sales figures in front of us. Uh, you're kind of a 60,000 copy kind of guy, aren't you? And frankly, Mr. McKenna, around here that really butters no bread. Uh, <laughs> we're interested in the million-plus seller. We can carry people like you, of course, uh, given that we have uh, substantial successes in other fields, but and on and on like that, to which I replied, so I guess you're not taking me to dinner at Elaine's, <laughs> which was true. <clears throat> not even tea. You cannot be half slave and half free. You cannot be half hip and half yup. <laughs> you know? Why do you not videotape your sessions? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea why. The question, can you? Yes, I can. No, well, we can arrange it. I just never bother because I smoke too much dope, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> worry about stuff like that. I mean, it sounds like a splendid idea, like so much that would happen if I stopped smoking cannabis. <laughs> what happens is that this stuff, which we call mind, takes the shape of its container the way water takes the shape of a container and when mind is folded down into the tiny insy beansy cramped container of bourgeois american materialist republican howly existence <laughs> It becomes a kind of a narrow experience of some sort, if you know what I mean. In a sense, what nature does is make the body a less and less comfortable place to be until finally you just say, all right already, you know. <laughs> Take and beam me up, Scotty. I mean, I tend toward row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. There's no business like show business. <laughs> There's no people like show people. But see, it's not about the exclusivity of method, but the combination of method. I mean, what you want to do is beat your drum while sitting in yab yum, while stoned on X, while at the holy mountain, while the astrological configuration is correct, and then, you know, you know, line it all up and then push it through. That's the way to do it, I think. Flimsy laws. Flimsy laws, again, made by men who wear dresses. Wherever there's bad stuff being done, these guys wearing dresses are to be found highly active. Why is this? Why is this? The church and the judiciary are, you know, in this weird lock on the evolution of the human mind. Confucius said... Uh, no tree grows to heaven. And what he meant by that is it's fruitless to project any process to infinity because any process projected to infinity creates some kind of catastrophic scenario. If no fruit flies died in six months, the earth would spin out of its orbit from the weight of fruit flies. No, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but what an image. <laughs> Somebody once told me if the earth completely disappeared except from for its nematodes that you could still see the outlines of the continents if you were standing on the moon. I thought, now just who gathered this? <laughs>
Well, yes, let me explain. Uh, the question is, what's with licking frogs? <clears throat> I'm not sure I got it right, but... Well, you know, you kiss a lot of frogs before you find a prince, and uh, you probably lick a lot more. <laughs> The religion is full of shit, the money is printed on toilet paper, fame is worthless. Too often we go into the psychedelic state and people say you should think of a question. These guys say, I've got questions of my own, you bring me questions. You know, why don't you bring me an idea? Why don't you bring me something I might want to have? I sort of believe that the reason I was given this is because they took something from me. What they took from me was everything I knew about the I Ching. I mean, I can just imagine them turning it over in their hyperdimensional hands and saying, crude, but the workmanship shows a certain sensitivity. Uh, you know, put that up on the shelf. And why don't you give this poor fellow something in return? And they said, well, how about a hyperdimensional map of space-time? I said, good, give him that. So, you know, here it is, fair trade. Uh, <clears throat> what is relativism? <clears throat> relativism is the idea that your ideas are as good as anybody else's ideas, and all ideas are equal in worth because nobody can tell what's going on anyway. It's the live and let live, laid back approach to doing intellectual heavy lifting. I'm a nihilist, you're a Nazi, you're a Christian, you're something else. Hey, no big deal. Let's just hoist a beer and party on. <laughs> Well, I have to defer. I mean, here's a period from 1725. Here's Voltaire's writing here. It's down here. I'm going here. This is the Franco-Prussian War, the American Civil War. Uh, the from the fall of Rome here to, let's say, here. Uh, you know, people sometimes with plants, they get the attitude that you need to do a lot because it's spread thin. In most cases, that's true, but in the case of nutmeg, it isn't true. It's a cap, a double O capsule. This doesn't count for the spice that you can buy from the chili spice rack of nutmeg? No, it does. Same, same. Yeah, well, the reason I preferred grinding the whole nutmeg was because it's obviously fresher. If it's ground, and you can buy whole nutmeg at Safeway. Prisoners know this. If you'd done more hard time, you <laughs> wouldn't be asking these questions. <laughs> For example, and I hope this doesn't bring somebody rising out of their chair in an air clawing rave, but um, <laughs> we seem to function well under pressure, and now we are coming under pressure. Not this. This is not pressure. This is the long garden party before pressure. When people can still, you know, worry about uh, whether they're getting enough antioxidants and so forth and so on. Not to gore anyone's particular ox. I'm as concerned about antioxidants as the next person. <laughs> And, and again, psychedelics are important because psychedelics show the power of the imagination. That it, where we want to go live is the imagination. You know, there's real estate out there, folks, and you want to get there first and stake your claim. I'm peculiarly useless in this sort of discussion because I have not been in this country enough to know my, whom I want to shoot. <laughs>
I'll point the gun. You pull the trigger. <laughs> the scandals are recycled. The philosophical issues are recycled. The technical innovations are recycled. The religion is full of shit. The money is printed on toilet paper. Fame is worthless. Rupert, it's noon. I'm going to have to go to a massage. Whoever it was who was marveling over my depth of humor and command of comedy earlier in the evening, you can now meditate on this talk. <laughs>